Long a great moat guarding Britain, the English Channel remains one of the world's most treacherous crossings. For over 4,000 years, it has balked many a challenger, generals, athletes, inventors, and plain lunatics. Representing the best and the worst in human ingenuity, they have launched or landed at the Dover Cliffs by boat, balloon, barrel, and bathtub. Now, a new challenger is ready. Resembling some prehistoric insect, immense, yet so light a breath of air can overturn it. This fragile craft will attempt the channel flight, powered only by the legs of its pilot. Though others have contributed, its design is largely the work of one man, Dr. Paul McCready an intense, taciturn scientist whose mind is filled with the formulas of aircraft wakes, the turning radius of hawks, the turbulence of clouds. Once the soaring champion of the world, it said he can read the invisible air. But it's Brian Allen, the slim, sometimes unkempt biology graduate from an upstate California college, upon whose stamina and will the final triumph or failure of the flight will depend. Stop. <clears throat> First make a man-powered flight over a mile-long figure-eight course, Brian now faces a challenge vastly more difficult, the 22-mile crossing of the English Channel. o'clock in the morning of June 12, the team is at work preparing the albatross. This time each control, each gear, each cable is checked again and again. The wing cleaned of condensation which can add extra pounds to the plane's critical weight. Across the nightbound channel, flashes from the Cap Grenet lighthouse 22 miles away remind them of the distance they have yet to cross. Each man knows that one oversight, no matter how small, can spell failure for all. At four o'clock, in the pale light of an English dawn, the albatross stands ready. But small wind gusts tumbling down the cliffs cause a risky turbulence. Offshore, the flotilla carrying crew and observers stands by. With guards posted around the albatross to warn off press and bystanders, sometimes blundering into its supporting cables, Brian at last prepares for the final lap in their long journey. Would you go channel one zero and stand by? As the wind subsides to less than two miles per hour, Brian receives clearance over the radio to take off when ready. Okay, Brian, uh, Zodiacs are in position. Uh, anytime uh, you feel it's good, uh, go ahead. Okay, there's a bit of a low now, so I'm gonna go right now. Hey, Roger. It is 5.51 a.m. speed of nearly 10 miles per hour, closely attended by his teammates and Zodiacs off each wing, he follows a course southeast to the French coast at Cap Grenet. Coast Guard from Tartan Channel, over. 
Coke Romeo, X-Ray Romeo, this is Dover Coast Guard. We wonder if you see us about five miles southeast of Oakstone on the radar. Roger, sir. Yes, we hold you on radar at this time. This is a Dover Coast Guard out. But now, approaching midpoint, Brian begins to encounter increasing headwinds. It appears that the fuselage is starting to steam up a little bit. Uh, does it look like it's going to be any sort of a problem for you? I think it will be a problem now. So, Dad, one, this is Dover Coast Guard. Come right, 2230, uh, four miles to run. At an hour and 15 minutes, barely at midpoint, Brian encounters more turbulence and headwinds of four miles per hour. Though he still pedals at a steady 75 revolutions per minute, his decreasing ground speed means that the estimated two-hour flight time is no longer possible. In growing fatigue, he falls lower and lower, sometimes mere inches above the swell. Sam from Control, what do you estimate Brian's condition? He's tired, but uh, he might be able to hang on. I don't think he wants to quit. Against the relentless headwind, the Albatross's ground speed has been cut to approximately seven miles an hour. For Brian, the flight has become a grinding ordeal. After an hour and 45 minutes, still more than seven miles from France, he signals defeat. He can go no farther. He must be towed the rest of the way. Obediently, one of the Zodiacs closes in, ready to attach a fishing rod to the fuselage for the tow. But as Brian struggles upward to allow the Zodiac to come underneath, he suddenly waves off his rescuers. At 15 feet, he has found less turbulence, decides to push on. Numbly, Brian pedals on, no longer counting time. His flight instruments no longer function, and his water supply is exhausted. When at last he sights the French coast through the haze, his heart sinks. It is still three miles away. Brian, each moment now, has become a victory. Dehydrated, suffering severe leg cramps, his judgment has begun to waver. Briefly, he considers crashing on the rocky point. Instead, he fights to save the albatross from the turbulence that claws at it and nearly wrecks it a few feet offshore. Slowly, at last, it is done. Jack, can you 
Can you give it to him because the top's coming? Take it easy. I want the worst Ingrid. Okay, all right. Take it away from these tables. All right, Brian. Let's back him up, hey, but uh, do you view yourself as a historical figure? I know I view myself as pretty tired. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brian Allen, Paul McCready, and all their talented team have won their triumph. But it's also ours. Through them, we have fulfilled an ancient dream. On man's own strength, we too have climbed the sky. Mm -hmm.